Well, thanks very much, and thanks for inviting me. I feel I'm here under false pretenses as a climate scientist, not knowing very much at all about tourism. But it's become clear to me over the years that the linkages between the two are very strong indeed. So I have a few points to make about tourism. And the first point really I wanted to make with you is you're dealing with customers who are among the most fickle of any organisation I know. Uh, there is no particular um, activity where your customer base can change so quickly, can change so radically, um, and, and can leave you high and dry with issues relating to things like stranded assets becoming an important consideration. So some of that will relate to what I have to say today, but nevertheless, quite clearly, as we heard this morning, tourism has been increasing in Ireland. It maybe levelled off in the last year or so. But what I want to make as a point to you today is that the perceptions of the tourist experience can radically alter the fortunes of a tourist destination and can alter it extremely quickly indeed. This is a tourist destination maybe some of you have been to, perhaps the, the most popular tourist destination in sub-Saharan Africa where the, the mighty Zambezi falls over the great escarpment uh, in Africa uh, and gives rise to this uh, huge waterfall, Victoria Falls, which then creates the largest uh, man-made lake on the planet, which generates uh, something like 90 plus percent of the hydropower of, of the big country of Zambia and quite a lot for uh, Zimbabwe as well. Um, and you can see the kind of dramatic scenery which attracts tourists. Uh, I, I was there about four years ago. I didn't actually go in June 2015, as you can see there. I, I went in September. Uh, and this is what Victoria Falls looked like in September. Uh, the tourists had gone. The establishments were closing up. Um, it was admittedly the dry season, but it was also one of the recurring series of really extreme droughts that have afflicted that part of the world as climate has become less predictable and more irregular over the past few years. And of course, when you have that kind of disaster in your tourist industry, it doesn't just affect the incoming tourists, it affects the indigenous people as well. Um, if you have no hydropower in your capital city for electricity, then you have power cuts of 12 hours a day, as I experienced. Um, how do you handle a tourist industry in that situation? And of course, uh, in the tropics, you don't need electricity for, cook, for um, keeping warm, but you do need something to enable you to cook your evening meal. And so the end product is that the charcoal cellars uh, that you can see here uh, deforest the landscape around them. The urban dwellers drag wood any way they can into the, into the towns and cities. And of course, it's the poor people at the bottom of the, the pecking order who have to walk further for their firewood, who feel the brunt of the climate change hazard that's really behind all of this. And it tells us that, you know, when we're looking at a hazard like climate change, it's those least able to bear the burden that actually are inflicted with the greatest impacts of all. It also tells us that things change, and we may not often be aware of landscape change. Landscape is your asset. Landscape is what people come to see in Ireland. Uh, we're not conscious of the fact that over time there are drivers which change landscape. This is a famous painting, of course, by John Constable uh, in the sort of uh, idyllic English landscape countryside uh, way back in the early 19th century. We can put our digital cameras down today in exactly the same spot, and we can see the difference in that landscape today. So <coughs> we're not conscious of the fact that there are driving forces behind changes in our landscape, changes in your asset going on. And of course, it's also important to recognise that the driver which is most important today is the driver of climate. And as we look at the way in which the world has been changing over the past century, uh, we can see the way in which that warming has become very pronounced indeed. And you'll see the colours changing from blue to, or to yellow to orange here. But you'll also see that there is a geography of warming, with the high latitudes warming more than the low latitudes, uh, with the interiors of the continents warming more than the oceans. And that tells us two things. It tells us, first of all, that when we talk about global average temperature, it conceals a multitude of sins. It conceals the fact that if we are talking about two degrees, uh, well, it may well be three or more uh, in the places where people are rather than for the globe as a whole. And the second thing just to bring to your attention is that if you are younger than 30, and there are a few, I think, in the audience, you've never experienced a month during your entire life uh, where the monthly average temperature was less than any month 
of the 20th century. So we're living in very strange and very, uh, very changed times indeed. And of course, we know the cause. Uh, there's no doubt about the cause anymore. We know the cause is what we're doing uh, to the atmosphere itself. But we can't see that. We can't make a cause and effect relationship that's very clear because we're putting things into the atmosphere that are colourless, that are odourless. And if you had a tonne of CO2, this is what it would look like. Um, and the sad fact is that each of us in the room here today produces about 12 of those balloons uh, in the course uh, of, of uh, uh, an average year. Um, so we're producing about one of those a month. Um, now, if we were to pile up those balloons, let's pile them up here at the entrance to Dublin Bay, you can see we're, we're producing about 160,000 of those in Ireland um, every day. And uh, you can see the dramatic way in which, you know, we're quite clearly changing things in the atmosphere uh, very radically indeed. And that's from a small country on the periphery of Europe. We know that we're going to continue to change the atmosphere and change the global climate, um, if we continue along the business as usual trajectory, then we only have a 50-50 chance of avoiding four degrees of warming by the next 60 years. Now, the next 60 years sounds a long time away. It's your children who will still be alive. It's your grandchildren who will still be alive. Uh, and those are the real choices they will have to face. And we have to ask ourselves, what kind of legacy uh, do we want to leave them behind? We also know that Sometimes we talk about global warming, but we really should talk about climate change and global climate change because it may well be rainfall that's the key variable in many parts of the world. In the marginal zones of the world, it's rainfall which will determine literary life and death. And there are three very sensitive areas that I think we have to be conscious of. The first, of course, is the well-known area of sub-Saharan Africa, where people simply need a certain modicum of rainfall to survive every year and without that we know the social fabric of many countries of many areas can disintegrate very quickly indeed. The second of course is the area of the low-lying small island developing states where many hundreds of thousands of people live maybe within two meters of sea level and we are facing the extinction of those cultures the extinction of those societies through no fault of their own but through the actions of the developed world. And the third and perhaps most serious of all are in the mega deltas of the world. The great deltas where, for example, the great rivers bring sediment down to the sea and then stop, and the sediment dump is dumped, and over time builds up and becomes so heavy <coughs> it depresses the crust of the earth. So we're getting subsidence at the same time as sea level is rising, and that's a really acute telescoping of impacts in a critical part of the world. In Bangladesh here, you can see the reds, for example, and the, the oranges, where you're looking at three or four meters above sea level. And where, if you think of Ireland for scale, we have about six million people on this island. It's about there for twice or three times the size of Ireland, but there's 160 million living in that, uh, in that zone. So where do those people go? Where do they move to in that very overcrowded country? Uh, which will create problems down the road on a scale which humanity hasn't really come to terms with. If you lose a third of your country, um, what would you do? Now, uh, all of that is important because um, whatever you think about the causes of climate change, that nature is telling us and confirming the fact that, um, well, things are happening quite radically. So here, for example, uh, a few weeks ago, you could have sailed quite happily from Kerry here all the way around the north, Cape all the way round into northern Siberia, all the way round to, to China and Japan, and not encounter any sea ice at all, very, coming very close to the North Pole itself. Um, and we know, that with a bit of ingenuity, you could have sailed also through the fabled Northwest Passage um, along the northern coast of Canada to the west coast of the United States and to southern Alaska, again, without really encountering any major ice obstacles. And that's something that our grandparents would have certainly not thought possible. Many of the early explorers gave their life trying to find that fabled Northwest Passage. Uh, the best known is, is this guy, John Franklin, of course, um, who perished with 129 of his crew after spending his life trying to find that Northwest Passage, which today is something we take for granted. And something which is now the new frontier in terms of trade and linkages between the developed worlds of Asia and North America. You can save $300,000 a trip uh, for an ore carrier 
using the northern sea route as opposed to going round the Cape of Good Hope and round the Straits of Malacca and so on to get to China. If you're a tourist, and if you are a tourist, uh, you could get a cruise over the past few years. Uh, Silver Seas cruising between uh, New York and Vancouver and between uh, Alaska and New York. A couple of trips made uh, on, a, on a cruise ship. I think it's quite expensive. I think it was around $21,000 per person. But they were full and they managed to do it twice. I think they've uh, got a bit of sense this year because you can imagine what would happen to tourists who were stuck maybe on ice uh, away up at the northern archipelago of Canada there, 4,000 mostly elderly people. Uh, how do you evacuate them? These are the kind of issues that are coming out. But this is where the new frontier is now emerging. And of course, we know the cause of all of that is quite clearly us in the developed world uh, as, as the primary causes. You can see the bloated uh, landscape, the bloated uh, map here of North America, of uh, Western Europe, of Japan, uh, and to a lesser extent of China and India uh, as the major contributors. But look how small the uh, areas south of the equator are, how small the, contribu the well, how small the contribution to the problem that is being made in places in sub-Saharan Africa and South America. Unless you think this little island up here uh, on the western perimeter of Europe is insignificant in its contribution, let me assure you that Ireland uh, emits more greenhouse gases than the 400 million poorest people living on this planet. And that's quite a sobering statistic, if you think a little about it, in terms of culpability, in terms of responsibility. So sustainability, for many parts of the world, is dependent on us actually accepting responsibility for those problems. Now the IPCC have recently published an estimate of what 1.5 <laughs> degrees of warming uh, would cause um, and, and effectively how much of the carbon budget is left for us before we enter irrevocably that kind of dangerous climate change arena. And you can see the 1.5 degrees here, uh, we have less than 10 years of burn left. Uh, if we want to avoid 1.5. We have about two to three decades left if we want to avoid two degrees. So we have a finite time to solve this problem. And we can't leave it to the next generation effectively to solve it because their options will be much more diminished than at present. And for tourists, well, there are tipping points which we have to recognise. Go and see the Great Barrier Reef now because uh, if we get to two degrees, it will be gone. Go and see the Alpine glaciers now, because they have already started a melt which may be irrevocable. Go and see Greenland now, because if we get to about three degrees, Greenland will be effectively, uh, if we sustain that, will be effectively on a course which will take it to an irrevocable ice-free situation. It may take centuries for Greenland, but for the other two, it may be much quicker. These are the tipping points we now know exist in global climate. We're not simply immune from all of that here in Ireland. Everywhere you go in Ireland today is a half a degree warmer than it was 30 years ago. Climate change is not something for Africa or Asia. It's happening around this year, and it's happening in every month of the year, as you can see. And when the next 30-year average comes out, that 0.5 will probably be around 0.7 degrees. From the modelling we've done, we know that we're going to have another half degree in the next 20 to 30 years. We know also that for Ireland, the problem will not be the temperature, but will be in fact the rainfall changes with more sustained winter rainfall and less intense and le well not less intense, less amounts of summer rainfall in the east. So we're going to see a twin problem of increased flooding in especially Western Ireland and an increased problem of water shortages where our population is in the eastern half of the island. And these are the real things we have to start planning and adapting for uh, just now. Indeed, we're seeing also extremes developing. We, we, we had the stormiest winter uh, on record for at least 143 years uh, in 1314. We had the wettest winter over most of Ireland uh, in 2015-16. And we have anomalous things happening, uh, such as wayward hurricanes, as we've seen more recently with Lorenzo, uh, but with Ophelia and other events as well. So these are happening, and the world, if you like, is beginning to see more or less rather, predictability in the course of global climate, but in the course of climate around Ireland as well. This is just an interesting comparison of February 
in 2018 and February in 2019. You may remember 2018, um, we had a, a really cold spring uh, in Ireland while North America was very warm and while Greenland, while Greenland was above freezing point, the North Pole was above freezing point, there was snow uh, in, the, in the Sahara, for example. Um, and then February this year, when even here in Kerry, the daffodils were out earlier than usual, spring was happening in February much more quickly than it had before, while North America froze in that situation. And we know that this is caused by now vagaries and irregularities in the jet stream, bringing extremes more commonly. But if landscape is your asset in tourism, there are landscapes which are threatened. There are landscapes like the, the peat bogs, like the salt marsh, like the machair of Galway, uh, like the montane habitats, um, which are really threatened by warm. And indeed species which maybe you took for granted growing up uh, are now on their last legs. There are only 160 breeding pairs of curlew left in Ireland. We've seen the demise of many other species as well. Uh, and cold-loving species like the Arctic char, which you get in the uplands, are not going to like those kinds of warmer conditions. At the same time, we're going to get invasive species. Not going to be good for the tourist cell. Um, when you see Japanese knotweed everywhere, when you see giant rhubarb appearing everywhere, um, and even pests of our forests, which we're, we're largely dependent on for our pensions. Um, and if you have a pest emerging, such as the horse chestnut leaf miner here, this is what it does to your chestnut trees. Uh, it was found, first of all, in Macedonia in 1981, and since then has made its way all the way across Europe, has made its way to the English Channel, has crossed through lowland England, uh, and this is the kind of appearance it does to your chestnut trees in, in June and July, and it's now spreading eastwards from the, sorry, westwards from the east coast of Ireland. So for Irish tourism, a number of points then I wanted to make with you. First of all, changes in seasonality. I know I'm a doom and gloom merchant, but there's uh, some good news, uh, nevertheless, uh, in, in this story. And that relates to the effect which warming will have on the Irish tourism summer season. We can develop an index, uh, which is widely accepted, uh, in terms of what tourists like, in terms of uh, sunshine, in terms of temperature, in terms of rainfall. And when we do that, we can get an index of, of what uh, conditions are like at present, but feed into them also what future models tell us will be like in, in the next uh, 20 to 50 years. And here you can see um, what the, the results show. The main thing I wanted to show to you here is that um, you can see that that green line at the top when we're looking at uh, the extra warmth means that by the next 40 years, 50 years, um, June, July and August become very good categories indeed in that climate index. You can see also the shoulder season extending into May to begin with, um, and May becomes the new June, if you like, uh, and also later on in the century, extending into September, and September becomes the new August. And that's very economically something which I think will be quite significant uh, for Irish tourism uh, in the long term. And it will be significant because if you apply the same index to other parts of Europe, as I've done here, you can see the purple at the bottom there is the Mediterranean, which becomes less attractive to tourists as time goes on. And that's obviously related to things like heat waves, related to things like fires and so on, which will be a problem in that part of the world. If you were in France this summer, you wouldn't particularly have enjoyed the heat wave there, in the two heat waves there this summer, where temperatures got well above 40 degrees, and which we now know was a once in a thousand year event by the old measures of, of natural climate. So these are things which are changing for Irish tourism. Um, it means that Ireland will become slowly more attractive to tourists, especially in our, from urban areas where heat wave conditions will become more common. This is some work we did in the loop to look at what will happen in some major cities with 1.5 degrees, with 2.7, with four degrees of warming. And you can see with four degrees of warming, Temperate region cities, like New York, for example, become annually heat stressed, and that means deadly heat waves every year. Uh, it means that, for example, even with less warming, Beijing <coughs> becomes annually heat stressed. It means that Tokyo becomes annually heat stressed. So there's going to be an exodus from those problem areas in the future. And, and of course, the worst case of all is the Middle East, the Gulf uh, area here, where the average maximum temperature 
uh, by the middle of the century uh, is going to be above 50 degrees centigrade, the average uh, annual, uh, the average daily maximum temperature. So you can't do much outside in that temperature. You want to escape. You want to go somewhere else. You want to maybe come to a cooler climate, and that may be an opportunity for Ireland. Okay, um, you know why people come to Ireland better than me. They come for the people, and they come for the scenery, the environment. That's the important thing, and you can see how environment has held up remarkably well uh, in the past few decades uh, here as, as something that the tourists find very attractive to come to in Ireland. <laughs> but things are changing, and we know now that environment is going to be the key sensitive variable in the years ahead. You, you've seen the, uh, the kind of uh, public outburst of concern that has been exemplified both by young people who have got the message much better, I have to say, than some of the older generation. You've seen that public outburst of concern uh, here in Ireland as well as uh, other places. That's manifesting itself firstly in terms of divestment. Ireland has become the first country in the world to publicly divest its sovereign wealth fund from fossil fuel investments, and that's a great achievement. That's going to continue, and when you see people like the Rockefellers divesting, uh, if you know what they made their money on, you'll know that the, the bandwagon is really rolling there as well. In terms of what we're doing about it, the public is not yet bought in to simply the radical measures that are going to be required. I mean, this is the Climate Action Plan, um, and it's not radical enough. Um, we're talking about 600,000 heat pumps in the next 11 years. Uh, we're talking about banning petrol diesel vehicles for sale in Ireland in the next 11 years. Uh, we're talking about a thousand more wind turbines. We're talking about a huge increase in electric cars. Now, whether you believe that will happen or not, uh, let me assure you it's still not enough for us to comply with what's likely to come down the road. Flight shaming was named this morning, and it's another issue which I think people will have to come to terms with in the tourist industry. Uh, if you take a single long-haul flight, you generate more carbon emissions than the average person in dozens of countries across the planet uh, emit in the course of a whole year. So you're going to have to come to terms with frequent flyer taxes, you're going to have to come to terms with curtailment in some cases, but from a, a customer base which is going to be loath to fly to the same extent as ha has happened in the past. So it's very important to position Ireland uh, environmentally to tackle these problems. And my last point is uh, that um, those very good figures for environment perception, um, I I'm worried a little about them because the Irish environment has not been improving. The Irish environment has been deteriorating in the past decade quite markedly. We only have about, about 23 pristine water courses left in Ireland. We had 500 in the 1980s. Uh, we see the problems of contamination of our water, contamination of our air, uh, biodiversity extinction risks mounting, and indeed our, even our habitats in our national parks are, are suffering degradation as well. The population hasn't really caught on to that yet, uh, but partly because the, the change in the, in the tourist customer base has been urban, uh, primarily rather than rural, over the past 10 years. Sure. So I think it's very important that we have more intervention from public bodies to protect those assets, to protect the natural environment. I don't want to see tourists coming to Ireland to see this kind of landscape. I want to see them coming to see this kind of landscape instead. And with climate change, it's very important that we get the balance right between them. Thank you. One of the, one of the your first slides was a, a kind of a, a travelling through time from 1951 to the present day and how the Earth's climate has, or the temperature has changed in that period. And I suppose the final image was, was, was obviously quite worrying. But if I read it accurately, and I did, I suppose initially I found it hard to follow, there was periods during that time where temperature raised in certain locations and then went down again. And I'm just wondering, what was the explanation for that? Um, but again, the, I suppose the final image was, was quite concerning. The second thing, I suppose, the general team, and you commented on it yourself, um, just about our responsibility and how, I'm not sure if we're gathering that we all have responsibility here, and in the presentation previous step to Sarah, one of the figures she gave was that 62% of people recognised that they themselves had responsibility, but that they also felt that 80% of companies, or 80% of people felt that companies and industries had responsibility. So we see there again that we're, we're, we're nearly willing to put the responsibility on somebody else, 
Yeah. And I've often heard commented as well by people that, you know, Ireland is small in this term. Professor Sweeney actually showed that we're not that small, but that there's a great responsibility in other countries. And it was mentioned how young people now re realize and recognize the threat. I think it's one area where our education system has worked well. The Green Flag Initiative in school has probably started uh, around the time of millennials. Millennials were born. And it's having an impact now, I think. But really and truly, even yourself, Olivia, you mentioned that young people, despite participating in the strikes and making the issue, are willing to wear t-shirts at home upon the heat. And there was notable concern, too, after the climate strikes in some of those urban areas, there was a lot of waste left behind. Um, so I suppose, if, are we really gathering our responsibility here? What else do we need to, to do to make see people see the responsibility? And the last question was just in terms of changing biodiversity. And it's really worrying that we have um, some of our natural flora and fauna at risk because of climate change. I just wonder, Professor Freeney, is there an opportunity in changing bi biodiversity? Uh, you mentioned the, the forest chestnut scale, I know it's not welcome. But are there other aspects where biodiversity is changing and we could potentially see some opportunity in that? <coughs> Okay, John Sweeney. Uh, thank I'm you. I'm standing up, John, so they can okay. see you. Yeah. Yeah. On the first point, um, yes, uh, global climate has always changed. Um, there's ups and downs, uh, lasting a few decades normally in the in the 20th century. And yes, there was a brief period of cooling around 1940 to 1960. Um, that, at those stages, um, I think we, we recognise now that the human impact of climate wasn't anything like as marked as it was. 50, 60 years later. And what we've done in modeling is simply run climate models with pre-industrial levels of CO2 uh, and look at how the projections match or don't match what the temperature curve has been in the past century. And in fact, they don't match at all. It's only when you put in the human contribution that you find an almost perfect match with the temperature curve of the past 20, of the past um, 30, 40 years. So yes, there will always be ups and downs. And if we have a, a major volcanic eruption on the equator, for example, in the next six months, we'll get a cooling of the global atmosphere by maybe half a degree. Um, but there are certain things that work in the natural system, which mean that we don't have a smooth transition <coughs> in terms of the temperature changes. So uh, it doesn't <coughs> negate in any way our understanding of the human role. Uh, as regards biodiversity, <coughs> well, I mean, we're seeing uh, changes which I think uh, are, are universally negative. Uh, we're seeing our native species in particular uh, being competed out of existence. We've lost a lot of our native grasses. The green island that you see outside um, is, is perennial ryegrass, which is itself not native to Ireland, and it's only kept going by intensive fertilizers every year. So we have lost a lot of our, our native species, and with it, we're losing also some of our animal and bird species on a scale which uh, we haven't seen before. Um, I don't think there's any positive aspects of it. Sometimes when you have uh, some of the, the freshwater sort of uh, zebra mussels, for example, in our lakes, uh, they clear the water for a few years, and, and it looks as if they're doing good. But in fact, uh, you know, the, the, the long-term trend is, is universally bad, even in that case as well. So I think, when you reduce biodiversity, what you're effectively doing is you're reducing the stability of the ecosystem, you're reducing the ability of the ecosystem to handle stress in the future. It's rather like if you have less species, you have less options. Uh, and as we lose those species, even if we are replacing them by invasive species, um, we're cutting off our options for the future. This is very clearly evident, not so much in Ireland, but in places like the, the Amazon rainforest, for example. Uh, where we're losing so many species that we don't even know exist at the moment, which may be beneficial for those that come after us, for example, for medical purposes. So I, I don't think we can simplify it. The point he's making about all of us <coughs> we need to accept our responsibility and perhaps not recognising sufficiently that unless we do uh, accept our responsibility. This morning, too. Yeah. People are struggling, but when we all accept, people are struggling to pay for it. Yeah. And we're reluctant to pay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's fair to say that we as individuals should do what we can, but we do need guidance and we need leadership from above to actually make a difference. So I think as one of the speakers said this morning, we need to have a pathway that we can conform to, that we can be satisfied that our individual efforts are leading in a certain direction. 
Uh, we shouldn't feel guilty about what we're doing or what we're not doing too much, but we should feel guilty if we're not being given the guidance, I think, to enable us to do the right thing in this area.